this is the reason why psychoanalysis was not excluded in Nazi Germany. Um, the Jewish colleagues, of course, were um, thrown out and persecuted. Freud's name could no longer be used, um, though his portrait did hang in the Central Psychotherapy Institute until 1938, which is already amazing. Um, but um, psychoanalysis was um, included as part of an eclectic um, uh, unification or reunification of the psychotherapies that took their original departure from Freud. Mainly Adler, Jung, and then Freud. Both Adler and, and Freud couldn't be named, but they played a prominent role um, in the establishment of psychotherapy in Nazi Germany. Um, it was heavily integrated within Nazi society and within the military as well. Um, but I don't want to go there right now. All I want to say is, um, it's as part of a series of uncanny continuities that we have trouble living with or thinking with, that psychoanalysis continued um, through this realization for our purposes now. I'm going to call it the realization um, of um, sort of a kind of sci-fi drive. Um, psychoanalysis continues to be a component part of what we're studying here, um, up to a certain point at least, and not uh, simply um, yet another theory that um, I'm bringing into this room to apply to um, sci-fi phenomena, for example. Um, so, um, it's really around this very brief essay, um, of course, as it is in place, um, alongside Beyond the Pleasure Principle and the essay of Uncanny, um, uh, where we get a good sense um, of this um, uh, particular uh, genealogy. Um, now might be a, a good time to break. Um, I thought that as an epigraph to our discussion, when we come back, we might look at two relatively, the clips from two relatively recent films um, that are about doubling, and hopefully um, we can continue from there. The text I have in mind by Benjamin is um, uh, a brief piece he wrote uh, for the newspaper, or, uh, yeah, um, uh, titled um, Books by the Insane from my collection. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in the essay, he uh, remembers <coughs> when he first read both Schreiber's memoirs and Freud's reading based on the memoirs. Um, it becomes very clear, given the date and how that, that essay reads. I'm not going to go into a scholarly argument now, but take my word for it. You might be convinced that it strongly suggests that Schreiber and Freud on Schreiber were on Benjamin's mind when he wrote Origin of the, um, of the German Women Play, um, which, you know, makes makes possible um, all kinds of readings. Schreber in terms of allegory, in terms of uh, the morning play, staging of morning, um, uh, and so on. It's important to keep in mind because what we do in receiving Benjamin is we tend to split off uh, the earlier work on allegory from the media essays, and that they are certainly conjoined over the red body Schreiber's memoirs. Um, if there's any truth to what I'm suggesting here. Um, it's in that essay that, that something uh, was um, lodged by Benjamin, but really forgotten for many, many years. Um, uh, Benjamin, who takes one to no one, immediately recognized the spiritualist qualities of the memoirs. And he grounds it in the press that published Schreiber's memoirs, which otherwise published only spiritualist tracts. Um, in the excerpt that I uh, asked you to read for now, um, uh, he mentions at one point, Schreiber does, that he belongs to a long line of ghost seers. And it, is, it does get thematized at certain junctures. Um, and I would say that if you look closely at the the systematic rendering of the New World Order in 
crisis toward a kind of recovery, we'll see that the attention he pays to um, uh, the situation of the dead in all of this, um, as, at least as much so um, as the future of the species, um, you know, bears that um, concern of spiritualism, um, um, which also, uh, in its own right or writing, conjoined um, the occult prospect of communication with the dead with media technical devices. Um, um, already uh, modeling, for example, um, what uh, uh, Schreber puts together in the so-called endopsychic perception um, that um, before it then recognized. wonderfully perverse, like necrophilic take on the deus absconditus. If, if what I'm hearing is God's intervention only possible through the corpse body, through the, through the cadaver. Or through the melancholy. Or, yeah, mistake through, the, the yeah through the error. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I don't think that's, I mean, error. it's not really an error. It's a content, it's a the error he needs to tell his right, story. Right, right. But I don't finish your But it's not kind of <coughs> in the rhetorical sense right. of covering the, the divide that mm-hmm. would have to occur between those mm-hmm. movements. Um, uh, it wasn't really a great question, it's just uh, I, I, I'm curious, and maybe in somebody who knows more about the day of substantitus and the, the notion of the unrevealed or the unturned towards. The God that never shows his face, um, never shows his face, and how, how that may relate to like post humanization or histories of post apocalyptic or like proto and post apocalyptic narratives. It's like super old stuff. Well, um, the reason I jumped on. That melancholic condition as being um, uh, particularly important. Yes, it's a mistake. It's the um, mistake that fools God as well. But um, having said what I said about um, spiritualism now, about Benjamin's interest in the encapsulation of the psychotic disorder and so on, um, I just wanted to um, close that. Uh, series of reflections by pointing out that, uh, that the more I've read around in this kind of material, the more convinced I've become uh, that something like melancholia, um, something like a melancholic identification, um, uh, is often a uh, prerequisite for this kind of stabilization or encapsulation of a psychotic disorder. Um, when Freud was first thinking uh, about the distinction between uh, transference and um, uh, narcissistic neuroses, he placed melancholia at the top of the list of what would later be considered psychoses. Um, and yet it's something that he um, endlessly was able to interpret. Um, melancholia thus functions, even within the genealogy I was trying to sketch for you, as the first borderline condition, the first place of legibility um, of uh, psychosis. And again and again, um, I found that something like an encryptment um, that you can then see in the course of the elaboration of the delusional system um, seems to be um, the battery, as it were, um, for uh, the overall stabilization and encapsulation. Uh, Jung, um, who was the first um, in the the psychoanalytic group to write about schizophrenia um, had rehearsed um, that um, study um, with uh, a study of um, the occult, of occult mediums, how they function in spiritualism, for example. And you can see how that um, became the kind of model for legibility that he then imports um, uh, into the schizophrenia itself. Anyway.
Okay, what I um, uh, want to talk a, a bit about is um, Schreber's breaking point, um, how we um, might understand that breaking point. We've heard already the um, a more current uh, opinion in the Freakonian um, reading that um, focuses on the symbolic and its relation to the real and so on, and insists upon um, uh, his social elevation as um, that from which all, all else follows. Um, but um, this was the, um, uh, the study that put forward um, the rather set notion that paranoid schizophrenia was always um, based on repressed homosexuality. Um, so I need to take some account of that crisis right now. I don't think uh, that Freud would have meant by that that Schreber was in the closet or whatever, and that um, he could um, have done something <laughs> about this. Um, but instead, um, what Freud was addressing was... Um, Say. He was addressing the social relation. He was addressing the social relation, which, which tends to be, especially then, um, same sex. A social relation where one can expect there not to be sexualization, um, the pressure of sexualization. Um, so, at one point, um, Page 73 of the original pagination. Um, right before um, the final paragraph, mark number three. If we review the ingenious constructions which were raised by Schreber's delusion in the domain of religion, the hierarchy of God, the proved souls, the four courts of heaven, the lower and the upper God, we can gauge in retrospect the wealth of sublimations which were brought down in ruin by the catastrophe of the general detachment of this libido. Okay, so something like sublimation um, is at stake here. And I think um, it's always a good idea to rescue sublimation um, from the tendentious view of it as some kind of Victorian construct. Um, it's just a nice, nicer way to address the repression that is going on anyway. Um, sublimation plays a, a very vital function um, in Freud's understanding of um, uh, psychic reality and balance. Um, to get some idea of, of the importance of this notion, um, Winnicott's uh, idea about the transitional object, he states explicitly, is his contribution to the psychoanalytic notion of sublimation itself. So sublimation is all about the need for respite um, in socialization from sexualization itself. There has to be a, a time or a place <laughs> where um, one uh, can recover. Uh, Winnicott will add to that, it's not just sexualization as such or itself, but also the ongoing um, attention to the relationship between inner and outer reality, which has sexual as well, of course, that's how we uh, also put it. Um, so there has to be an ability um, to pull back. And without that, um, uh, a severe crisis can occur. And this is what happened to Schreber. We don't know exactly, certainly there's a predisposition, but at one point, um, his, the, the hub of social relations, beginning with um, his doctor, Flexic, a transferential object. Um, ev all of these figures suddenly wanted to gang back in. And that was the onset of the crisis. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how it, that's what it is. <laughs> I'm even mean, being less explicit than Schreiber. <laughs> so um, it's because of this um, over-sexualization 
of the place where he um, expected and required respect, that he withdrew um, all the libido, all the libidinal relation from the world. So faced with this kind of a crisis, and other crises that qualify perhaps, Freud suggests that the only response can be a total withdrawal of libido um, from all, uh, from every relationship. What's implicit in that, of course, is that the whole world is nothing but the sum total of those relations. Um, one way, um, the, well, Freud suggests one way to think about it. He says, to some extent, this always happens in mourning. Um, the libido gets withdrawn from the world back into the ego. To a lesser extent, it's a total scenario for sure. Another way that I like to think about it is, especially since everyone or every other person is beginning to get the sniffles here, that when you um, feel ill, ill enough to stay in bed, um, you do experience a withdrawal of interest and investment in the world. Things that you would otherwise like to do um, are no longer um, of interest. And in a radical way, um, this is what happened to Schreiber. Um, everything was uh, severed, and all of that libido um, returned, one can say, given the second period of narcissism, returned to the ego, um, which under this impact, of course, threatened to implode. Um, what can follow from such a crisis will be catatonia, fade out, suicide. I don't know how psychotic his older brother was, but he did commit suicide before this. Um, whereas Schreber, and this is it's, it's so we're invited to enter the, the delusion when we see him as such a blessed figure. He, and he alone, <laughs> was able to reproject all of that libido, um, externalize it again, so that uh, even though it's not the old world, and even though it now lacks that wealth of sublimations Freud refers to, it's just the same, a new habitat in which there is... <coughs> relay in which there can be found and experienced a relay of relations so that he can continue to be in the world that needs to be to survive. Um, so uh, that is um, uh, uh, the nature of the crisis that leads then in the reprojection of libido to that moment of recovery or reconstruction. Uh, that is so crucial in our understanding of Freud and of the placement of Freud's science within this genealogy of sci-fi that I'm trying to um, um, argue for, as it were. Okay, it's... I yes. just have one, uh, one quick mm -hmm. comment, I guess, or mm -hmm. comment slash question. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at the Schreiber case online and came across something that says... Um, in his Schreiber study, Freud uses the term um, ver, 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 Yes, and to characterize the third form of repression. And I assume, and it goes on to say that it was translated into projection. And I didn't know if that was the same projection here because it says that that translation of projection is wrong. And it should be like full closure. Yeah, it should be full But, but, but I don't know. know. But in a sense, it said projection in here, so I didn't know. If that yeah, I don't know what translation they're referring to. Yeah, because so we don't have have that from here so much, yeah. but um, um, that would be a mistranslation. But Freud also talks about projection, which is translated properly. Um, yeah, after the um, well, or now, but um, this other form of um, uh, uh, well, basically, um, Freud introduces. Uh, two, hence the confusion, um, two um, uh, varieties of repression, as it were, both projection and uh, foreclosure. And foreclosure is the gist of the Lacanian reading. Um, this is where he develops the whole notion of the name of the father, mm. is in the reading of the Schrader case. Now, don't fault me, but I think that that notion of Lacan's puts back the understanding of psychosis for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. Though it is itself a great notion, um, you know, as it circulates and it is applied to all sorts of situations. 
But the notion, as you know, is that um, uh, everything proceeds in the name of the Father, in the terms that I used earlier, after the third person um, is integrated as a binding figure and we enter the order of substitution. All those substitutions, even as part for the whole of the body that I talked about before, all of that ultimately proceeds in the name of, of the third person now elevated to the name. So um, the law, you name it, all of that, um, folds out of the name of the Father. Um, and that is precisely, according to Lacan, what the psychotic always forecloses. Um, Whereas the projection, um, as Freud uses it here, interrupts himself um, at one juncture and says that, well, in a future study, um, I will spend more time in developing this notion. So he gives himself a kind of license for that deferral. In the standard edition, um, the editorial note uh, points out that this never takes place uh, discussion. Uh, and yet the work that follows the Schreber reading is totem and taboo, where there is in fact an elaborate rereading of uh, projection as it takes place um, in mourning. Um, and not just in mourning, but um, in haunting. So it's, it's Freud's um, really one address to something um, uh, other than mourning. Whereas I would say mourning and melancholia, everything's about mourning. Um, here, uh, in the Totem and Taboo, he talks about relations with ghosts and vampires that tend to take us um, into a, uh, a different region um, of mourning. Um, let me just uh, finish this for a moment. What happens there, and it happens here too, to some extent, to a lesser extent, what happens in the use of projection in Totem and Tabu is um, the argument, which you, you may know, but let me just uh, repeat it, that um, because uh, when someone close to us dies on us, certain um, thoughts that are early and perhaps ongoing um, become um, unacceptable to us. We can no longer entertain our mixed feelings or the departed um, uh, at close quarters. We no longer accept the ambivalence um, that is an inevitable part of relations with um, those close to us. Um, or more to the point, um, we cannot accept the death wishes. Um, for Freud, uh, it's uh, inevitable um, uh, that our love objects are also the recipients of our death wishes. Um, this is a long argument that I'm not going to go into now, but. Freud called the omnip omnipotence of thoughts as it characterizes um, uh, the early intact narcissism of the infant is first flexed in the wish um, that the parent who doesn't satisfy one right away be gone or be a goner. Um, so the death wish is one of the first, um, what should I say, um, the first deepening <laughs> of every relationship close relationship. Anyway, all of that cannot be accepted upon the initial news of um, someone's departure, someone close to us. And so we project all of that onto the departed, literally onto the corpse, um, and the corpse is reanimated um, by this material um, and now comes after us, um, hence as vampire, um, vengeful spirit, or other um, um, malignant figure. Um, but notice what happens here. There's not only a reversal, not only a reversal of the death wish, but also a hiding of the reversal. Because we don't just give to the vampire, for example, our own ambivalence. The vampire is an ambivalent <laughs> um, But turn, we turn that or hide that hostility, uh, that uh, ambivalence, inside the outright hostility um, of the creature out to get us. Don't get me wrong, in the, in the texture of the vampire narrative, there's plenty of ambivalence. But in this model <coughs> that Freud is talking about, of the vengeful dead, um, 
uh, we see how uh, projection works as another kind of repression. So it's not just that something gets thrown uh, into the unconscious, as it were, but it gets um, recycled um, through reversal and a kind of hiding um, in that reversal. And some of that, um, to conclude my response to your question, some of that can be seen uh, in uh, an earlier part of what you have in your excerpt here, uh, where he talks about the ways in which both in, um, in jealousy and in, in other and paranoid um, senses of being persecuted, how um, something like homosexuality, in fact, um, is being uh, rerouted via the, um, uh, the conspiracy of enemies or the conspiracy of suitors of which one is jealous or whatever. Um, so also a kind of reversal and hiding of an initial illicit thought or desire. Okay, let's take a break. Put me uh, an email which explicitly uh, explained to me that I wouldn't be giving a lecture. <laughs> and so when I arrived, I saw my name on the roster and found out what data sticks are good for. <laughs> and um, the lecture I, I ha had, a recent lecture, was something that was commissioned by the conflict majors at uh, NYU as a kind of graduation lecture. And they wanted me to do something on Philip K. Dick since they were mostly um, asking me just then because of the recent study of Philip K. Dick's work. And so I had to think about something that I hadn't covered in that book, something in Dick. And um, that wasn't uh, particularly hard for me to uh, identify because I knew I had left something uh, explicit or uh, major. Um, out of that reading, largely because um, you know, when one writes books, one tries to stagger the theme so that one isn't always publishing the same book. So I had left out the um, implicit issue in Philip K. Dick of psychopathy. Um, implicit, I say, because he never uses that term, probably for good reasons, but it's implicit in his um, valorization of empathy. Remember, that's what, uh, in, uh, what's being tested for when we do androids dream of electric sheep. Um, but that implies that the um, absence of empathy, um, a kind of ruthless violence, uh, is something that we try to identify with a rather slippery term, uh, psychopathy or sociopathy. Anyway, I'm, I'm finishing a, another study of, um, uh, another reading of uh, slasher <coughs> films. And so I wanted to reserve that problem uh, where you know, the psycho is obviously uh, in, uh, in the center of things. Um, so anyway, I returned uh, to science fiction yet again to find um, ways in which uh, psychopathy is addressed or if you prefer ruthless violence um, in science fiction. <clears throat> it's actually... Um, dressed in terms that I can recognize now, genealogical terms, um, that um, are the motivation for this class, too. Um, when I started at the Academy of Fine Arts in College School uh, in April, I'm also carrying forward um, the work I had done for the lecture, um, I decided to give as my opening seminar something titled um, in German, Deutschland and Science Fiction. Um, that, of course, is modeled on uh, Heine's sort of pseudo-reconciliation with Germany, or rather with his own ambivalence um, in relationship to Germany, Deutschland and Wintermärchen. Um, so, um, uh, that's in the background. three days uh, here at GS. So um, I'd like to um, start with the Doppelgänger for a great many reasons, the double. Um, I'm going to try not to jump the gun too much 
when you're trying to stagger my remarks too, but I can't help but say um, that I've been struck um, how a certain process of selection made the double or the doppelganger the figure um, to be accorded um, uh, memorable narratives uh, in German letters. Because if you think about it, all the uh, folkloric um, uh, relations with all the other occult figures, the vampire, the werewolf, and so on, are heavily um, at home um, in the German tradition. That's really the homeland of all these figures. And yet, they never made it into um, narratives like Stoker's Dracula, for example. But it's the double um, that was selected um, as the uh, German contribution. To um, a cult figuration, um, but instantly out of order uh, that a cult figuration shares with science fiction. Okay, so uh, for the session today, I, I asked you to look again, I probably, at um, uh, the essay on the uncanny. Um, I uh, uh, selected as an excerpt. Um, the section where uh, Freud talks about um, the uncanny as an occult figure. Um, but I'm also going to make reference now, of course, to portions of the essay that I didn't um, have copied for you. But I'm going to assume that you're somewhat familiar um, with the essay in its entirety. First, um, Another introductory remark that will um, motivate um, our inclusion, um, I'm assuming, of some film clips as well, and of the film medium. Um, Friedrich Kittler um, uh, observed uh, very succinctly at one point um, that the, the double um, underwent a shift um, from the literary medium all at once into two related media, film um, and um, uh, for its um, understanding, uh, psychoanalysis. So psychoanalysis and film um, are the two heirs um, to the doppelganger um, as the uh, figure was presented in uh, German letters, in particular uh, in German Romanticism, um, hence this is a reading of A.T.L. Hoffman's The Sandman. Um, I think um, if you keep uh, Kittler's observation in mind, um, you'll note that at least in the beginning um, of this uh, proposed uh, transfer, um, many of the films that we associate with the introduction of the double <coughs> into or as film, like The Student of Prague um, in 1913 1914 um, by Rye, um, that we see um, in them again and again um, uh, references to Romanticism as sets, certainly. Um, German Romanticism accompanies the transfer um, as a relay of props. Um, the early 19th century uh, attends the student of Prague um, rather completely. But even in a film like Metropolis, um, the creation of the double for all the uh, uh, techno-futurist um, aspects of that um, uh, scene of creation, um, uh, there are also uh, in attendance um, certain uh, romantic, demonic um, features like Construction of the mad scientist Holtman, um, his laboratory space, uh, and so on. Um, here, as I already said, uh, in the case of Freud's essay, we have quite explicitly in the foreground um, the romantic narrative, um, the Sandman. But before we get to that, I wanted to look at two footnotes in the essay. 
236 are two, um, two footnotes that follow one another. The second one, uh, in Evas is uh, der Student von Prag, which serves as the starting point of um, study on the double. Uh, the hero was promised, and um, so on and so forth. Please note that it's a reference, um, when Freud makes the reference, he refers to the screenplay, not to the film, um, whereas if you were to look at Wang's um, study, um, it's clearly um, about the film. Um, this is um, an interesting side note, um, because Freud um, certainly uh, turned to the technical media in analogizing his uh, thought about um, psychic mechanisms over and over again. The only thing he refused to uh, include, or well, refuse is perhaps the wrong word, but he, the one medium he didn't include, and here we see with what care he excluded the medium, excluded it and included it, um, is of course Phil. Um, but that um, has led many of us to um, assume that that's because film is um, uh, the strongest uh, endopsychic double um, of psychoanalytic <coughs> theory. Psychoanalytic theory, which uh, under Freud's aegis postulates um, the development of psychic reality as an alternation between identification and projection. I realize these are um, older terms that Lacan kind of translated and swept to the side, but we hear in those terms um, uh, a rather detailed uh, compatibility um, with the film medium at that time. Uh, identification as a form of uh, inclusion and cutting, of editing, um, and projection, of course, is the, the mechanism of uh, animation um, that's also specific. In a um, study that we're not uh, consulting here, but which I recommend to you, it's um, Victor Taus's uh, case study of Natalia A. Um, from the World War One war years. I think it's 1915. I might be wrong, but it's during World War One. Um, it's the essay on um, the origin of the influencing machine. Uh, and how it uh, develops uh, in this particular case study. Um, it begins as a projection um, of uh, doubling of her own body, um, projected out um, across a certain distance, across which she experiences it as controlling her, influencing her. Um, and in the course of Task's study, he shows how it begins to develop or change um, until it becomes that abstract or generic um, uh, <coughs> influencing machine uh, with which psychiatrists are so familiar in the treatment of psychotics, at least at that time. Um, so it begins as a kind of mummification or doubling of the body itself, um, and is abstracted until it becomes the influencing machine, as much a word as anything else. Um, but in between, um, what makes the transfer is what she herself identifies um, as a similarity between the machine at that point and the cinematograph. Okay, um, that's the, uh, the content uh, that refers to the content of that footnote, um, the strange way in which um, film um, is kept at a certain distance um, by Freud um, from his work. Um, which is the very um, guarantee of, of a certain proximity. And then in the earlier footnote, the one that precedes that one, uh, in the text <coughs> on page 235, um, uh, he refers to the Faust um, legend, specifically Georges <coughs> Faust. Um, the connection between the foot two footnotes, of course, is that the student of Prague is a um, version of the Faust legend. Um, but here, um, he is um, paraphrasing, but it's uh, recognizable to any reader of German literature, um, that he's also citing or summoning uh, Burgess Faust. 
I believe that when poets complain that two souls dwell in the human breast, and then, and when popular psychologists talk of the splitting of people's egos, what they are thinking of is this division in the sphere of ego psychology between the critical agency and the rest of the ego, and not the antithesis discovered by psychoanalysis between the ego and what is unconscious and repressed. Um, so, uh, Faust um, is brought in here at this uh, juncture um, uh, of renovation within psychoanalytic theory. Um, these World War I years um, uh, were for Freud a time of deregulation of his thought, um, which then issued uh, in the formulation of the so called second system. Uh, the documents that belong to this period of trans transition include the essay on the uncanny, um, <coughs> introduction to psychoanalysis and the war neuroses, but also um, at the other end, as it were, the, um, the text beyond the pleasure principle. Um, so uh, here, the renovation, as he explains, is to think uh, topographically um, uh, no longer only in terms of the divide between the unconscious and consciousness. He never, um, uh, shall I say, refutes that, but adds to that um, the complication uh, of internalization. Um, so now the frontier of the uncanny is not only um, the surprise encounter with the unconscious, but is at the same time um, the institution the doubling or splitting of the ego itself, um, familiar to us as the experience of the conscience, our conscience, as it were, self-criticism, what have you, um, and which will later become um, established in psychoanalytic theory as the superego. Um, so <coughs> um, here doubling undergoes, at least for psychoanalytic theory, this um, renovation and it's taken inside uh, psychic reality and inside the ego itself. Um, but it's also um, an invitation to consider, however briefly, um, Goethe's Faust, um, which of course is um, also part of what I'm, um, I'm now referring somewhat loosely to German Romanticism, this German Romanticism. Um, it's an interesting um, inclusion, especially in the footnote Underworld, to a reading of the Sandman, because it pursues a different um, uh, itinerary, um, but uh, beginning on the same turf of crisis, as it were. Um, before I just consider briefly with you um, uh, Goethe's Faust, um, let me just say um, that, uh, well, you saw this already in the excerpt from the reading of Schreber, um, but elsewhere too, um, Goethe's Faust um, inevitably attends um, Freud at moments of um, important rearticulation, like the introduction of the notion of the superego itself. Um, but in order to understand earlier on um, the notion of meaning of the end of the world um, and psychotic delusions, he has to turn um, again to Goethe's Faust, um, as you might have seen uh, in that excerpt. What's interesting about Faust, Faust I, um, is that um, uh, we attend um, Faust uh, uh, in the beginning at the moment of crisis. It's a, a kind of doubling crisis um, from which he is able to graduate by seeking a series of compensations or substitutions, um, notably uh, his turn to translation. He decides to translate again um, the introduction of Logos in the New Testament, um, which then leads to Aristophilus <coughs> um, uh, appearing before him as the new form of doubling, as it were, which allows Faust to defer for the duration 
um, of this work, The Suicidal Impulse.